um, an event that is hosted by the Art and Literature Department at Parkway Central, uh, where we host local publications and invite them to discuss their process uh, and vision. In the past, we've hosted such local publications as The Shoutflower, Secret Admirer, and Caldera Magazine. Uh, tonight, we host Larry Robin of Moonstone Press, uh, formerly of Robin's Books, uh, and Moonstone Art Center. Uh, and I would like to, I'll sort of give a brief biography that he's provided, but um, then I'll have a, you know, we'll sort of open the floor and have a few questions. Um, but we'd like to sort of discuss how he got involved in poetry, his process, uh, how he goes about publishing and, and how he went about promoting events and setting them up. Uh, and then we'll open the floor probably within a half hour or so uh, to the public if anyone has a question they'd like to ask. <clears throat> so um, Larry is the director of the Moonstone Arts Center, which in 2021 produced 130 poetry readings and published 30 chapbooks. Uh, he was the president of Robin's Bookstore, the oldest independent bookstore in Philadelphia until it closed in December of 2012. Uh, he served on the boards of the Pennsylvania Center for the Book, the Read Aloud Coalition of Philadelphia, and the American Booksellers Foundation for Free Expression, uh, on the literature panel of the Pennsylvania Council for the Arts, and the advisory boards of the Mayor's Commission on Literacy, uh, as well as the Philadelphia Inc. program of the Pennsylvania Humanity Council's Year of the Pennsylvania Writer and Art Sanctuary. Uh, Larry created and directed the celebration of Black writing for 18 years, the Paul Robeson Festival for seven years, Poetry Inc. for 22 years, uh, as well as a variety of other Moonstone programs. Uh, he's currently producing poetry pro programs since 2009, the Hidden History Project, citywide festivals celebrating the life and work of social activists such as John Brown, Francis Harper, Martin Delany, and Ida B. Wells. Um, so with that said, um, I sort of wanted to sort of have a, a starting question for Larry, and then I guess we can sort of go from there and let him uh, expound upon that. But I guess my first question to you, Larry, is if you could tell us your sort of background before books and how that may be education or something like that, and how you sort of came into all of this, because your, your resume is so impressive and you've done so much over the years that... Um, how did it really start? Um, there really is no background before books. Uh, uh, you know, my family uh, owned Robin's Bookstore. My grandfather opened it in 1936. Um, I, I was pretty much a committed reader from about the age of eight. I just would sit in the corner and read and read and read. Um, you know, I'm in that unusual position that I've spent my whole life doing the things I love, which was selling books and promoting uh, literature and poetry. Uh, coming out of the book industry gives me a slightly different perspective than, than many people. And I'll say I never went to school. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a academic. My base is uh, you know, based on the experience of the bookstore primarily. Um, I was asked to do a program on poetry. Uh, I said, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not a poet. And I said, actually, I don't even like poetry. What I, what I like are words. What I like is what you can do with words. Uh, you can write a 300 page novel. You can write a three page poem. You can write a three line haiku. How are you going to communicate? How are you going to get other people to see what you see, to feel what you feel? You know, my, my relation to literature is an emotional relation. Um, and they're, they're the, the writers I, I fall in love with are because they made me feel something. You know, and I think that's the magic, right? Uh, you know, I understand, <laughs> I understand the need for form. I understand the need for, you know, but, but the magic is when someone makes you feel something that you don't have any experience about. You know, you know, how, how does that happen? Um, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've had thousands of writers come through 
uh, Robin's bookstore and and you know they're all I mean most of them are incredibly interesting and they all have stories and they all play with language right um, Sam Delaney was here Sam Delaney's this phenomenal science fiction writer started out as a science fiction writer um, I started reading him in 1968 and I said you know this guy's so smart you know he must be a generation or two ahead of me and then um, he was living around the corner I met him and he was six months older than me said, how can you be so smart and be my age <laughs> right? but one of his books is called on writing and this is what maybe 25 years ago and he said you know if a word doesn't add something to your sentence don't use it right? <laughs> that's that's actually brilliant you know and i keep finding myself going through things i've written crossing out words that didn't add anything uh, and then that, that gets it down to the down to poetry right i mean it's the conciseness how do you say this tightly um I think that's the background. <laughs> Sam, you want to answer another question or you want me to just keep talking? No, uh, I did have another question. I guess, <laughs> how did you, when you started promoting events and booking events, how did you go about, did people come to you? Did you reach out to people? Did you just only, did you sort of have, have a, a idea of who you wanted uh, for a particular, you know, you talked about some of the people that had come through the bookstore. Um, was there any rhyme or reason or you just sort of? Uh, being the bookstore was the center and, and because we had the bookstore, uh, I, I could do events. And once upon a time, publishers would send writers on tour right? and, and they would go from city to city and. Um, and we were, you know, we promoted ourselves as one of the stops. So we had, we had amazing writers. Um, but what happened, we, uh, we, we were, you know, Robbins was, um, we moved every 20 years. The, the bookstore started out on 11th of the market, then it moved to 13th of the market, then it moved to 13th and Sanson where we are now. And, and this was a bigger location. So. I said, now, now I have space to do stuff. Uh, and, and these things started, uh, we, we were pretty much the only store that sold African-American literature. Um, you know, we had more than a dozen famous poetry books. We had a wall of poetry. We had a wall, you know, a whole section of African-American literature and, and especially left-wing politics. And uh, because we, brought people's books in and we promoted people and had events. Uh, we met people and Philadelphia is interesting because a huge number of really terrific people live here and they go to New York to get paid to do the work. Right? But they live here. You know, um, uh, one of the things you mentioned was um, <laughs> Philadelphia, the year of the Pennsylvania writer and um, they did events all over the state and this Philadelphia one was called uh, Philadelphia Inc, I-N-K. Uh, and I really liked the title. So I began, <laughs> I created a, a, an annual series called Philadelphia Inc and being the buyer, book buyer, whenever anyone, whenever an, uh, a publisher rep was here, I was like, you know, you know, who's from Philadelphia? And every year I found over a hundred people from Philadelphia who had published that year and we would send out invitations and we'd get 20 or 30 40 people uh to show up we'd have a party and they'd get to talk about their books and we'd get to sell them uh and it was it was just very fun and from that we developed the, what i think we call it the ink programs uh oh well, let me back up again uh because especially uh the section on African-American literature. We knew many of the uh, African-American writers in town um, and we became friends and we moved. When we moved, we said, you know, we, let's have a party. <laughs> uh, so we, we kind of, you know, the celebration of black writing 
And, um, you know, you do these things, you know, you know, 20 people show up, we'll, we'll really be happy. Uh, the same kind of thing happened. I, I'd invite uh, a group of people and we'd have their books out and they'd get up and talk about their books. Um, and it just took off. I mean, you know, dozens and dozens. I mean, the, the store was packed with people. Uh, I said, well, you know, I guess this worked. I guess I should do it again. So, so we did it the second year. By the fourth year, we actually were at uh, the library and the place around the corner, uh, community center, that's on Lancaster Avenue. Um, and we, did, we, you know, we expanded from just the presentation in the one day to having panel discussions uh, and a lifetime achievement award. One of the things that I was always interested in is, you know, that generational issue of all these incredible people who get forgotten. Uh, so we would design the celebration. So I'd have a poet, a novelist, a children's writer, uh, a nonfiction writer, a publisher, uh, and then we'd, we'd have a lifetime achievement awardee, and that would be an older person from previous generations. Um, we have Dorothy West, who was at that point the last surviving member of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, just, you know, kind of incredible. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the inks, so we had Philadelphia ink, we had poetry ink, we had children's ink. Here had some of the flyers there. Well, uh, anyway, I think there were six of them. There's a uh, women's ink. Women's ink. Yeah, you know, and all these things is is I mean that's an interesting issue. Um, of why why it's necessary to focus on various groups you know I, I had a situation where someone came in and, and objected to an author being in our african-american studies section because the person was a good writer <laughs> and this is, you know, of course they're a good writer right but the problem is that you need focus groups in order For people to understand uh, the the diversity of the community, um, and same same thing with women's thing, same you know, uh, you know, and and how do you how do you promote uh, diversity and self reliance and uh, it's all this political stuff that actually lays underneath uh, of of what we always do. Um, we want people to hear each other. We want people to experience something uh, beyond what they would normally do. I'll go back to when I first started thinking about publishing, we had this meeting and this person said, uh, oh, you should only publish good poetry. <laughs> what does that mean? Right, and I looked, so what you mean is I should publish what you like. <laughs> um, <laughs> And you know that's 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 not what I want to do. I mean, I don't know. I don't even want to publish what I like, right? I, what I want to do is is create an environment where people can express themselves and and hear each other. So uh, our our biggest program is Poetry Inc. and and the book that we just did the 25th anniversary book. Um, yay! <laughs> Oh. And what we do with Poetry Inc. is, uh, you know, and when this was the 25th year we did it, is we invite everyone. We invite, you know, it's not an open reading. You have to sign up. And then we put everyone in alphabetical order. So you don't get to read with your friends and you don't get to choose what you hear. Right? I mean, as we get older, we, we tend to limit our vision. We tend to create a smaller and smaller world that we live in. And what we want to do is is force you to expand. You know, uh, you know oh, I, you know, I only like sonnets. Well, I, listen to the spoken word piece. You know, listen to this haiku. Yeah, you know, 
how can you say I only love? You know, uh, you only you don't like something because you haven't heard the best of it. All right. How how do you expand your thinking? How do you, you know? I mean, one of the real issues in the world today is is communication. How how do we talk to each other? How do how do we, you know, develop that understanding and uh, it's 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 a real it's uh. I think that's a core of what's going on in our world today is, is the lack of ability to talk to each other and to listen to each other. Um, and, and that lays underneath of our publishing, it lays underneath of our pr presentations. Um, it, was, it was what drove the bookstore. Uh, um, I think I'm ready for another question. <laughs> uh, I guess it's just sort of, and you sort of touched upon a few people that have performed, but what are some highlights? What, you know, can, is there anybody that you think back say, oh my God, I can't believe oh. we got them to, to read at the, the, the store or do an event? Or is there any particular event that you're particularly proud of or look back on and say, well, I can't believe, you know, pull that off. Something like that, highlights. Okay. Um, I'm gonna come, go, okay. So when, when we do our publishing, I'll get back to that. When we do our publishing, um, about half of what we publish are chapbooks for individuals. And, they, and we do have an editorial committee and all that. And, um, but we don't have an attitude. We don't, we don't have a, Oh, we only do this kind of stuff. But what I really love is doing our anthologies. Uh, and at this point we're doing pretty much one a month. And what that does is it, it touches an issue and it prompts poets to respond in their own voices about a particular issue. And that's what I really love, you know, to get, to get the variety of voices around something. Um, one of the ones, uh, there was, <laughs> there's a, there's a book called What Saves Us. It's an anthology by Martin Espada, uh, which is a great anthology. I mean, normally uh, you go through an anthology and if you find a thousand pieces you'd like, you do, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just, I am, I just kept marking, you know, I like this one. I want this, one of the poems, uh, was by uh, Brian Turner, uh, and it's called uh, At Lowe's Home Improvement Center. And, you know, I mean, we all know what post-traumatic stress syndrome is, but I don't think any of us feel it. I mean, if we haven't experienced it, how do you, you know, it, it's this intellectual understanding. And what Turner does in this poem is he makes you feel it. It makes you experience uh, post-traumatic stress. And it just boggled my mind. You know, again, what you can do with words. And what it did is it, it stimulated me to do a, an anthology for Veterans Day. And we called it the disaster of war. And the disaster of war is what it does to human beings. You know, so we reached out to veterans and families of veterans and to the general public uh, to talk about what war does to us as individuals. Um, and we got, we got some great stuff, but that's what I love doing, right? <laughs> Stimulating thought and response and sharing through words. Um, yeah. Oh, and I, I, that was supposed to lead me into answering your question, and I forgot what your question is. <laughs> uh, it was more, and I think you did sort of answer it in a way, but just some highlights of particular events, obviously uh, the anthologies. Okay. So uh, I, I just said, uh, this, this is a flyer, just, I've, been, I've been sorting all the paperwork. This is a, a flyer of the events that took place. In uh, 1993, um, the first person is Dennis Brutus. 
Dennis Brutus is, was a South African poet um, who, an activist. And if he weren't political, he probably, well, even being political, he was considered the best African poet writing in English. Senghor was considered the best African poet writing in French. And Dennis was just mind boggling. The, the poetry I love most is the people that talk about what you're not supposed to talk about. It's, it's uh, you know, that's where, that's where the real issues are. That's where, you know, that's where we get in trouble, right? Um, Dennis was a great, a great poet and he became a friend. He came to the celebration of black writing and he would come to Philly twice a year and we would do something together. Um, the same month, we had Sonia Sanchez and Ted Jones. Um, Ted was living in uh, France for the last 30 years before he died. Um, and they were both activists in the black arts movement. And we did a program, we had, we had someone come with a bass and they, they did an impromptu poetry reading. It, it, it was mind boggling. Um, we had Ernesto Cardinal, who was Minister of Culture of Nicaragua, who was a poet. Um, looking for other poets. We had Maya Angelou, a uh, novelist and poet. And we had uh, Eleanor Wilner, who lives down the street, who is just a phenomenal poet. <laughs> and um, Michael Weaver who uh, lived in Philly for a while. And, and but these were, I mean, great poets. I mean, these were really, you know, it was mind boggling to, to be able to have this group of people. Um, in, in the celebration of act writing and the Paul Robeson festivals, uh, we had Pete Seeger here twice. Uh, um, what was what was so interesting is I, I look at I look at people that knew the subject, you know, and they were famous and and you know and I would say, look, um, we're doing a program and it's a community program and I don't have any money. You want to come talk? <laughs> um, and they would, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, 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 most of this was funded actually by the Pennsylvania Humanities Council. You know, and, and I was saying, well, I, I don't even have an honorarium for you, but, but I have a token of our appreciation for being here. <laughs> um, it's interesting, because when you reach out to people on a human level, you, know, uh, you get response. You know, so you have people like Sonia Sanchez who gets thousands of dollars to speak at a college who would come and do something here free. You know, it, it's uh, same thing with Dennis. Uh, <laughs> a fellow named Jan Carew, um, who was really, a, really an interesting guy. He was a friend of Dennis's. He had taught, he had been teaching at Lincoln and he taught at Northwestern before that. Um, and we, <laughs> Uh, he, he was in three governments overthrown by the CIA uh, in, in, uh, in Ghana and uh, Guyana and all of the, another place. My brain forgets things. So we're, we're sitting here um, and, and Dennis comes in and he's a, he wants a copy of, of Anthony and Cleopatra. He had just come back from the opening of the uh, library at Alexandria, uh, but he, he liked the Folger Library editions, so he wanted a copy of Anthony and Cleopatra. And and Jan says, "Oh, I was in that play um, on Broadway with Lunton Fountain." <laughs> right. and this guy, this 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 guy was you know a, a history professor, uh, a language person, a painter, a poet. And an actor, I mean, it's mind boggling what art does. Uh, but, um, yeah. Um, Next. <laughs> well, I, that was the last question I have. And um, 
Looks like there is somebody, Zoom user, uh, has a couple of questions. They said, to clarify, you never paid your poets to read. And then they also wrote, who is a poet that you wished you could have hosted, but didn't, didn't, didn't get to have? Um, um, first of all, I've never had money. Um, even when we were funded, I, I, you know, nor have I ever been paid uh, other than working for the bookstore. Um, and it's probably totally, and I believe artists should be paid. I just haven't been able to do it. Um, again, I, I'll, I'll flip this around a little bit. Oh, um, Dennis Brutus, I mean, who I just absolutely love, um, was inspired in South Africa by, by uh, W.H. Auden. Auden was his hero. And he then got the chance to read with Auden in London, which is kind of mind boggling. Um, who do I wish with? There are so many. Uh, Terrific poets. It's really, you know, I don't, you know, there, 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 there are people, you know, from Philadelphia, um, nearby who come, who come through, and and I don't think there are anyone better than them. I don't, I don't, you know, Eleanor Wilner is probably one of my famous favorite um, poets. Um, W.D. Earhart, I think, is just terrific. Uh, I'm looking at, <laughs> I'm looking around. I'm facing uh, a pile of some of the, the poetry books. Um, Sonia Sanchez is one of my favorite poets. Margaret Randall is one of my favorite poets. But these are, these are all people who who challenge us, who talk about the things you're not supposed to talk about. Um, you know, and not just socially, but personally, right? Uh, they, they don't, they don't make those lines. Uh, who would I have liked to hear? Uh, I really like Donald Hall. I heard Donald Hall do without at the Dodge Festival, and it just, it, you know, <laughs> without is is a poem he wrote when his wife died. Um, and you know, I sat there in those audience, and I didn't couldn't figure out whether I wanted to cry or I wanted to applaud. I mean, it, it made you feel this feeling, and it made you cry. And at the same time, you were, you know, just so amazed by his skill and his ability to use language. You know, I mean, it was an interesting conflict of. Uh, Emotion. Um, you know, I really like Martina Spada. Uh, like I said, Eleanor Wilner. Um, I heard Yetzhenkov read once at Penn uh, when he was here, uh, who I thought was amazing. Uh, <laughs> that's a hard. That's a harder question. <laughs> You know, and we all, I'm sure, have, have different favorite authors, and, and that's a good thing. You know, um, um, well, I guess that this could be a good time if, unless Alina, if you got any, I know you had some st uh, stuff to show, maybe a question, but we could also maybe open the floor up if anyone wants to type. A question into the chat box or you know if you could un unmute yourself and, and ask if you you wish to do that um but yeah i guess we can open up the floor now what do you what do you say about yeah i'll, I'll jump in really quick um i just want to say as a librarian at the free library what you said about creating a space where people can speak and be heard um you know this idea of having people read in alphabetical order rather than ranking them and so many ideas that you brought forth are so 
alike to what we do here at the library. You know, it's very inspiring and it's just um, uh, wonderful to hear. But also I wanted to um, tell everybody, I, I, I was, we were talking about this earlier before we started, but um, there are collections of research files here at the library and the literature department um, has a collection of uh, programs. So some of the um, things that Larry mentioned, the uh, Philadelphia Inc. series, the Paul um, Robeson uh, Festival, uh, the annual celebration of Black writing. So there you can see um, all of the poets that read are being documented here, the events, uh, these, these are words that were held, uh, including at the library, <laughs> we were talking about that. Um, so um, these are um, these are available here for people to ask. I'm, I'm, I don't think they compare to the archives you have, uh, <laughs> but um, there's some documentation of these uh, of these things here, which is pretty great. Um, but yeah, I I um, I guess I should ask a question too while I have the floor. Um, I guess. Um, Maybe this will come up anyway, but uh, I wanted to ask about the Zoom reading. It's, it seems you've been so incredibly uh, prolific uh, in the Zoom era. There's been, what, 130 uh, last year? Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, there, I'll, I'll answer that, and then there's something else I want to do. So I, I really, I'm not a tech person, um, you know, and I really resisted a virtual programming and we do a, a weekly program at Fergie's Pub every week live and then we had this break because we couldn't do live events uh, and, and kicking and screaming I, we went into Zoom um, but and it's not live you're still watching television it's still talking heads but boy you can reach the world we did we did some of these anthologies and you know, it's two o'clock Sunday here, and this one person said, well, I'm in Australia, and it's 6 a.m. Monday. Uh, we did a program <laughs> with, with this Irish poet, uh, Fiona Bulger, who's, who's, who's terrific. And we did it at 10.30 Sunday morning, because the one poet was in Michigan, and then it was 10.30. Fiona was in Dublin, and it was 3.30. And the third poet was in India, where it was 8.30. And they could all be in this program and bring their own, you know, um, you know, well, I've, I've ended up taking, you know, in Philadelphia out of my materials because I get stuff now from all over the country and all over the world, you know, um, which just boggles my mind. And I love that expansiveness. And at the same time, I hate it not being live because there's a, there's a spirit of live. Right. And both in poetry, in theater, in music, it, there's nothing like a live performance. Uh, what I wanted to touch on <clears throat> is that there's a, a philosophical, psychological, educational base to what we do. And it, come, it comes out of progressive education. And it, it's I start with, and, and I misquote things and I make simplify it and all that. So if you're an expert on this, forgive me for oversimplifying. <laughs> but you know, I love these quotes, right? So um, John Dewey said, you don't give someone something to learn, you give them something to do. And in doing it, they learn. That's the basis of learning. You know, I, have, I would have trouble with grants uh, because <laughs> they'd ask these questions of, uh, you know, do you do workshops? Well, no. You know, well, what's your educational function? Well, people presenting is the educational <laughs> function. You know, people learn by doing. People learn by being around people that are better than them. Uh, um, you know, that's how, that's how you learn things. Um, Jerome Broner said you could, you know, the importance of repetition and, and he has concept of spiral uh, curriculum where you, you introduce something in a simple way and you, you make it more complicated session by session, year by year. And I mean, that's what we do in schools, right? But, but it's, it's part of, of how do you develop and, and grow? Um, I love Elliot Eisner who wrote a book called, among others, 
um, art and the creation of mind. <laughs> you know, what the arts teach is that there's multiple answers to every question. You know, what multiple choice testing teaches is that there's only one answer and that's not true. <laughs> um, uh, all, so much of this stuff started at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, um, but I like Lev Fakowski, who, who argued with some of the others that the education is a, is a social activity. And he came, one of his theories was the zone of proximal development. And he said, you know, this is what you learn by yourself. This is what you learn by interacting with, with peers and teachers. And that's the zone of proximal development. You know, the importance of social, socialization um, in every aspect of what we do, especially in, in terms of how we learn things. And we never stop learning. I mean, this is, you know, um, you know it's a lifetime uh, project. Uh, and it's really important is what keeps you moving. And that interesting relationship between <laughs> between the arts. Um, I, I had mentioned Jeanette Winterson. Her other book of essays, and she only has two books of essays. She has a net book of essays called Art Objects and Cranthas. Art Objects, Art Objects. Uh, and she has a story in there about um, being somewhere and walking past an art gallery. And she said, I was never particularly interested in visual art. And, and she stops and, the, and she sees this thing and it, you know, and, and she doesn't understand her own reaction to it. So she said, well, of course, what I did is I went to a bookstore and bought every book on art I could <laughs> to try to understand. Uh, you know, or to just, um, but the, that interrelation of art, uh, we have one, we've done a couple of things of, of, of poets who are also musicians and poets who are visual artists. Um, there, there are amazing people that have multiple ways of expressing themselves. Uh, so I find it, again, I'm just, life is mind boggling. <laughs> Your turn. If anyone, there's, it looks like there's one, another question from Zoom user. Uh, was there a high watermark period for Philly based on your rich experience and why? <laughs> I don't know if you used to be a center for publishing a couple hundred years ago. Uh, um, I, I, like, I like Philly. You know, um, I don't know high water. Uh, we're... we're We're not considered the top, and that makes us more livable. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, things come through here. Um, I had mentioned that, that in doing the celebration of Black writing, there were all these African American writers that lived here. Uh, when we did Philadelphia Inc., uh, you know, I'd find a hundred writers a year that got published through all the, all different forms, uh, and you know. Philadelphia was livable uh, and, and you could do your work and you may have to go somewhere else to get money. Um, so I'm not sure how that, you know, what that has to do with high water. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's, uh, I mean, it's changed, it's changed with people moving down from New York, prices have skyrocketed. So that's an interesting, uh, yeah. But I think Philly has been pretty amazing. I mean, not that we don't have all sorts of incredibly important major issues, uh, but we've been a livable city and, 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 um, and, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Until you get into certain specifics, right? Uh, when you get into the, the realities of, of racism and sexism and 
socioeconomic issues and who, yeah, but we're not quite going there. <laughs> Um, does anybody uh, else? Oh, looks like uh, Linda has a comment. From your experience, would you want to revisit? I guess uh, best part of your career thus far. Um, and from your experience, would you want to revisit again, but with your current lens? So mm. your. I guess what I, I've been very lucky. I, 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 I've done what I've loved my entire life, from running the bookstore to the political activity that I had to doing the art center and, and educational and, and arts activities. Um, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. The, the, <laughs> the, the flip side of that um, is that if you're doing what you love, you, you become a workaholic and uh, it, that's all you do. Uh, and one of Dennis's poems is called For My Sons and Daughters. And he, and he confronts the, the thing you don't talk about for artists and for political people of uh, that your children pay for this, you know, because you're so wrapped up in, in what you're doing, you're so involved that your children get ignored. Um, and that's hard. Oh. you know, there's lots of mistakes. I mean, we all make mistakes. Um, again, I've been incredibly lucky. I've lived through them. Uh, some, some, some people don't. Um, but I don't know that there's much. <laughs> Struggle is important. Right, uh, and perspective is important. Um, yeah, I don't you know, say to go back and oh, I would have done this differently. <clears throat> I don't know that I can say that. Um, you know, the thing you're doing is based on where you are at the time, and and I don't. Yeah, that's that's a funny. I, I can't answer that quite. <laughs> okay. Um, there doesn't seem there's any other questions. So if there's, um, I probably have about fifteen. Oh, looks like Barbara Wolf. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask Barbara? I just had one thing I wanted to say. Um, I was working for Larry when Maya Angelou was there for the first time um, at the South 13th Street store, 108. And there were not many people showed up. It was maybe 20, 25 people because it was the first time she was there and the word hadn't really gotten out yet. And she did a wonderful group reading of Langston Hughes, Jump Back Baby, Jump Back, where she had the group around her. And she would recite the poem and then everybody would yell, jump back, baby, jump back. And it was just one of my favorite memories. It was just such a fun thing to be there. And I mean, her voice, I could listen to her read the tax code and be enthralled. She's got the most beautiful voice in the world. And it was just such a great evening. And I know, you know, thousands of people got to have experiences like that because of Larry. So thank you. Interesting memories. Yeah. Um, so, um, is there anything you know, else? I've, you, oh, sorry, Larry. Yeah. Um, you know, I pulled out show and tell books, but I didn't pull out some of this poetry that I would have. Uh, Yeah, I don't have it at hand, so it doesn't matter. Um, but what is amazing is how good, how many people are so good, you know, in, in the arts, especially in, in 
uh, I mean, in the poetry, because that's what we've been working with um, young people. We have a project called uh, New Voices, which are poets from 10 to 25, uh, kind of up until you get out of school. Um, and we've had a couple 14 year olds that were just mind boggling. The first youth poet laureate, which was chosen by Sonia Sanchez. Sonia Sanchez was the first Philadelphia poet laureate. And she chose the first youth poet laureate who was Sideri Beckman. And she was 13 and a half <laughs> and she was good. And we have continued to work with her over the, you know, she just got out of a college. She's gonna be a lawyer. <laughs> And she's still good. I mean, you know, it's it's just you know, kind of mind-boggling. Uh, but but you know, um, that there are young people, you know, that see things clearly, that are able to speak about things. Uh, you know, gives you gives you hope for the future. I mean, it's, uh, you know, us older people tend to look down on young people. Oh, why didn't they, they're not doing what I would have, you know. But, you know, it's so important for young people to find their own way. And I mean, if you look at the world today, we didn't do such a good job, you know. Um, I, but, I, have a, I have a question that's kind of related. I'm sure I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. <laughs> no, no, please do. Um, I, I was wondering if you could speak about, um, you know, the, the, there's, there's been so much of uh, the slow dying of uh, brick and mortar independent bookstores and so many have closed, but then we're seeing so many new ones pop up and there are so many young people interested in uh, printing, publishing, uh, and opening uh, independent bookstores now. So I wonder, wondering if you could speak to that. Um, sure. Um, I was at one point the president of the Mid-Atlantic Booksellers Association, right at the point at which everything was dying. Um, within a couple of years, almost half the independent bookstores in the country went out of business. Um, and it was a combination, the growth of the chains and, and the death knell was, was Amazon. Um, the same thing that has, hap has happened in bookstores, that has happened in groceries, that has happened in some, you know, that, that there are niche areas that the giants can't handle. And that's where you're finding these new stores. Um, Molly Rosakoff, who has a, a bookstore on 9th Street, is working on a project to um, do a map of independent bookstores. And um, she said there's 60 small independent stores that have opened in the last couple of years. And that's, that's incredible. Um, there's, there's, you know, we, yeah, I, you said, how, how does the world work? Is it a pendulum? Is it a spiral? How, I mean, but, you know, it's that famous, famous, uh, you know, the only permanent thing is change. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, you know, at the very point that you're saying, oh, it's all dying, and then all of a sudden it didn't die, it came back to life in a different form, maybe. Yeah, but I, I, I just so, uh, and the issue of publishing is so interesting, too, um, because I mean, there's been the consolidation in both publishing and in, in book selling into these giant chains. Um, no. Penguin and Random House were the two biggest companies, so now they're one. Uh, and they they just kept them from buying another uh, company, which is important. It's important to have that variety. Um, but the thing is, the modern technology means that almost anyone can do the physical creation. Uh, I mean, we do our books, um, we do chat books, 40 pages for individuals, you know, on a machine in our office. This machine can do this stuff. Right? The issue becomes, how do you get it out? How do you reach people? Right? 
the manufacturing of it, I mean, and the price levels are are an issue. But um, <laughs> I had a friend. Um, he went to, to uh, an event with Gwendolyn Brooks, and he he handed her a couple of poems. As you know, you know, I wrote. I mean, he was a young man, right? I wrote these. You know, could could you? She said, "Where's your book?" He said, "I don't have a book." She said, "What's wrong? You don't have a staple gun?" <laughs> it's it's you no, know, and it, it takes being a girl. It takes it takes. Take something out there. Um, but every time you get depressed, you something happens that makes this is oh well, maybe it's not as that bad. You know, maybe something's coming around. Uh, yeah. Which doesn't mean you should you doesn't mean you can stop fighting and stop educating and stop, you know. I mean, again, as a bookstore person, my faith and belief was in education. You know, and that's why I was trying to do with with my stir what I try to do with the arts. You know, it's it's you know <laughs> it's it's an enlightenment, maybe myth, right? Of that education is the base. Right? Um, you know, one of the issues. Oh boy, Paul, you know, you know, the whole issue of censorship. And I've been frantically against censorship my entire life. We were the test case for Tropic of Cancer uh, in the in the early '60s. Uh, we were the test case for the um, oh the the other law that Andrea Dworkin got all over the country: child child access laws. Uh, we both lost both, um, <laughs> but you know the the issue of of Censorship is a huge issue uh, and of education. And these are the things that are being fought about in, in weird terminology um, all over the country today. You know, what can you teach in school? What can you, how do you call this? What's the, you know, how do you get people to know more? You know, um, you know to create, develop critical thinking so people can make their own decisions about things. How, you know, how do you get past the bombardment um, and the whole issue of, of, again, of technology and the algorithms that reinforce a particular thought? You know, uh, people do, you know, I mean, I was never a big newspaper person, but you, know, you get a newspaper, you get different arguments. Uh, you get that, you know, I mean, you can go through you know, your computer today and, and just reinforce whether it's left or right or whatever it is, you know, I mean, you don't get to, to confront, you know, and it's that, I think that's the really important in terms of both the arts and in terms of the politics uh, around the world. Um, Nina, Nina has her hand up. Unmute. Hi, Larry. Hi. Um, this has been a wonderful, wonderful hour. Um, and so it made me think, I'm, I'm so glad this is being recorded. I don't know, you know, how it will be made available. I hope it will be able to be made available generally. But it made me wonder about, um, have you, maybe it already exists, but um, have you written up, you know, some, uh, you know, this history and the story of you and Robin's bookstore and just what you talked about, all the people that came through and, and all this, you know, I, I love you're talking about poetry, but also have that's integrated with the arts in general and especially the, your position about this really being about uh, a certain kind of uh, belief in a certain kind of education of openness and experimentation and doing in order to, to, to learn and uh, it, all those kinds of things. and. I'm just wondering if this exists. Have you written this up? Has someone else written it about you? Have, you know, it would be wonderful to have just the, the experiences that you've had in all these people who've come and your own ideas. Does that exist or is that something that could the, the exist? Clo the closest we've come 
is, is the 25th anniversary. Um, and what happened when I was doing this is we had interns, uh, I am totally dependent on young interns, not only for technology, but for stimulating my thinking. You know, I, uh, and we were, we're going through, because what I did for the 25th anniversary is I, I wrote to hundreds of people who had read here over the years. Um, and in fact, we have 300 poets in this book. And, and I found myself telling the intern stories about some of them. This person is important to me. This is what they did. This is, you know, and then I realized that belonged in the book. So I have 15 stories about poets of why they were important to me. Uh, and how they helped me develop. Um, there is, there's kind of a, a very brief history um, in there, uh, as well as kind of what I was saying about not liking poetry. It's, 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 I call it my confession. It's because my love, my love is words. You know, um, what you do with words. Um, uh, and I'll say this other thing too. Um, um, you know that whole thing of grant writing. The two, the two, the other question they ask: Well, how do you how do you guarantee the quality of the people you're presenting? And that always really bothered me. That, that, you know, I don't. Right? <laughs> yeah, part of my position is that people need to be able to express themselves, and they get better by hearing each other. And I don't want to say, hey, you're not good enough. And I'm not, one of my favorite things is when someone gets up in front and, and stands in front of the microphone and is, is shaking and says, this is the first time I've ever read in public. Uh, I, I just, I love that. You know, there was a, an incident in, in uh, one of the Poetry Inc. programs and there were two people with the same last name. And the first person got up and, and she was a young woman and she did her poem. And the second person got up and she says, I'm her mother and I've been writing poetry since I was her age and I have never read in public, but if she can do it, so can I. Right. I mean, that's, that, <laughs> that's what make, you know, those things that make it worth what you're doing. Right. Um, yeah. Um, Allison has her hand up. Hi, Larry. Um, well, I'm sitting here on this Zoom screen looking at some of my poetry colleagues and friends who've read for you. We've read for you together. And I can't tell you how meaningful it's been to all of us uh, to be able to come and read at Moonstone and share whatever we're working on. You've always invited us warmly. Um, you've made Moonstone, whether it was at Fergie's when we were going, or even on Zoom, you've made it like a home for us. And it, it's pretty amazing what you've offered to us. And there's so many zillions of people who come see you now through Zoom. So you see it's spreading throughout the world. When I came to that reading with somebody from France and somebody from Africa and somebody from England, um, it's been kind of who thought it would be in a way so good, um, mm -hmm. you know, that something really horrible has turned out to really be a boondoggle for poetry in some ways. You can't make up for being live, but you've done so much for me personally and for the friends that I've read with for you over the years. And so I just want to give you the feedback that what you communicate um, is carried out from us to the world too. Um, and so we can't thank you enough for all the great readings, both as an opportunity for us and also to come to all these great readings that you've given us. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, thank you, Allison. You know, you never know whether what you do means anything. You know, it, it's, um, yeah. <laughs> You, you almost have to internalize it, you know, and just sort of blindly continue doing what you think is right without really considering what other people think. <laughs> uh, you know, otherwise, you know, 
Um, it's an interesting contradiction. I'm a firm believer in contradiction, right? Um, because you need to move forward based on what you think. And at the same time, you need to counterpoint it with other people's thinking, but not being controlled by them. You know, uh, again, as we are working with the interns, it's been insane doing it uh, virtually because part of, part of the intern experience that I love was you'd have a group of people and a subject would come up and everyone would stop working and start talking about it. You know, and that's where the real learning took place. And that's where, you know, and for myself, I don't know what I'm thinking unless I hear myself, myself say it. And I don't hear myself say it if I don't have someone to talk to. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and the interns have been sort of great for that. Uh, you know, it, it, it makes me more aware of uh, what I think. And, and, I, I, and I tell them they, they, should, they should argue with me because I mean, I have my own thoughts. It doesn't mean I'm right. right? And it doesn't mean I'm gonna do what you think, but it helps me to have that conversation. <laughs> right. Um, does anybody have any further questions for Larry? And also that just to uh, clarify in the comments, the literature department does have a copy of the 25th um, anniversary or uh, poetry ink edition, but it's not in the, it's not, I don't believe available to put on hold just yet, right? Is that right, Alina? Yeah, it's, it's in our internal catalog, but it doesn't show up on the public catalog. So I don't have oh. a link to share, but it's, uh, you can check tomorrow and you'll be able to put a hold on it to borrow it. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'll, be, I'll be terribly commercial and say, you can get it from our website. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think we have I don't know, 150 books now, um, mostly chat books, but also um, you know, I don't know. We're, we're doing an annual uh, haiku book. Some of these things we're doing annually now. Some of them are one shot. Um, here's one I really like because it's it's um, Peter Barrow and it's his artwork uh, on his poetry book, uh, which is you know. And these are one of some of the perfect bound books that we've done. Um, oh, I like stories. Okay. This is um, the, way, the way things work, people come, we have an open reading after every featured reading. Um, and this young woman came because a friend of her was reading and participated in the open. And the host really liked her and invited her to be featured, and which is when I saw her. And she was just graduating from St. Joe's and they had allowed her to do a manuscript on homelessness in poetry for her master's thesis. Um, and I thought it was really terrific. Um, and I said, you know, I can't do that big book, but we could do a chat book. Uh, and she said, well, I don't have any money. I'm just getting out of school. I said, that's okay. Um, we'll put the book together. It'll sell for $10. Um, I'll, I'll print one for you. <laughs> You can go sell it and come back and buy two more for $5 each. But you don't have to have investment. I mean, again, I'm a firm believer in, in making things work. Right. Um, so I started working on it. And I said, you know, this really wants to be illustrated. Uh, and we reached out to this wonderful photographer I know, um, Harvey Finkel. And... Uh, and he let us use his photographs uh, for, uh, for the book. So it's a, we have an illustrated book, a book illustrated with photography. But uh, yeah. Uh, well. and, and, uh, what do you want to do, Sam? <laughs> Well, I would say uh, if if any there's no further questions, is there anything else that you wanted to share or say, sort of in conclusion or 
to wind down or? Um, the nonprofit world is really weird. Uh, you know, whatever organizations you like, you should support, whether it's theater or music or poetry or whatever. Um, it's really important that you that you show your support. Hold, hold on one sec. I... I, just, I just, I had this piece of Dennis's work hanging up on my wall. Um, so I'm gonna end with, I'm gonna end by, by reading you a couple things by Dennis Brutus. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you stories about then Dennis, Dennis, uh, was teaching English in Soweto. And um, everything from America was pretty much banned by the South African government. So uh, he had a relationship with sailors coming on American ships and they would smuggle him copies of Evergreen Review. Uh, and he would teach his students <laughs> English from Evergreen Review. Uh, for one of the things we were doing with him, he had, uh, he wanted to do a program on Kenneth Patchen. And somebody had said, well, well, you know, why does he want to do that? So I wrote and said, well, how come you want to do something on Patchen? And he wrote me back a poem about Patchen. Uh, um, terrific, terrific. So this, this poem that is very meaningful to me, I was talking about the, the, the issue of um, family, what an artist does. Uh, with his family. It's called For My Sons and Daughters. And I am very bad at pronunciating things. It's a decoding disorder. The letters don't have sounds. It means I mispronounce stuff. Memory of me will be a process of conscious and unconscious exorcism. Not to condemn me, you will need forgetfulness of all my derelictions. And kindness will only be yours if you insist on clinging steadfastly to some few small exaggerated symbols. This much he cared, or thus he did. And if he could, he would have done much more. This I can understand for my affection enables me to penetrate the decades in your minds. And now I seek no mitigation, but even welcome some few words of scorn. But it might help if reading this, if after adult bitter years, you're enabled then to say, he really cared then, really cared. Our fictions have more substance then. I will not ask you then to add what I do now. My loneliness, my failures, my argument wish to serve, my continental sense of sorrow. It was me to work and at times, I hope to share your better world. I just find that amazing. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you all for being here. Um, and Thank you, Larry. And before we end, um, we do have uh, our Monday Poets um, poetry reading series for the literature department still happening. Um, it is on Zoom. Uh, the next one is in February, I believe, 24th, 28th. And that's um, Marianne Dages and Erica Mena, who are, um, who are poets and they also are uh, they're bookmakers too as well. So it should be a really interesting uh, event, uh, insightful. You can find more information at freelibrary.org slash lit. And yeah, thanks again to Larry for doing this. It was really uh, incredible. Uh, and I, you know, we all really loved hearing your, what you had to say and your story. Thank you so much. That was so meaningful and beautiful.
Yeah, uh, have a good night, everybody. We'll send out the link for the video if you'd like to rewatch it. It'll also be on the Free Library YouTube page. So yeah, have a, have a great night. Thank, thank, thank you. you guys for inviting me. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hi, Susan. Hi, Barbara. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Just had to get that in before I left. <laughs> okay.